All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure some more people will continue to trickle in. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's sustainability seminar with Autumn Hagsma and John Yelich. My name is Emily Gusky, and I'm a community engagement and outreach specialist at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, which is a part of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. We'd like to start today's seminar with the university's land acknowledgement. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. To remind ourselves and our community, we will begin this event with the following statement. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years, we will be a vibrant community inclusive of all of our differences with native peoples at the core of our efforts. We'd also like to note that all Illinois Sustainable Technology Center seminars are certified green events through the University of Illinois Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment. To find out more about certified green events through the university, you can visit sustainability.illinois.edu. To find out more about ISTC seminar series or sign up for the event email list, you can visit istc.illinois.edu slash events. A couple of housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded today and that recording should be available within a week or two. Everyone joining us online will remain muted and we'll take questions at the end of the seminar. You can put those questions in the Zoom chat feature and I'll read those to the speakers at the end. If you're having any technical difficulties, you can send me a private chat message. Today's speakers are Dr. Autumn Hagsma and John Yelich, who will be presenting Community Engagement, Outreach, and Education, a core foundation of the Michigan Geological Survey. Autumn Hagsma is the Director of the Michigan Geological Re Repository for Research and Education and Assistant Director of the Michigan Geological Survey. She leads carbon sequestration research and other energy and climate resilience related research. She has developed community benefits plans, interacted with communities and stakeholders in multiple settings, and helped develop a strong social media platform for broader outreach and education. John Yelich is the director of the Michigan Geological Survey. He leads multiple mapping programs, including glacial and groundwater mapping, critical mineral mapping, and aggregates mapping. He regularly interacts with communities, regulators, legislators, and Michigan sovereign tribes. Through his efforts, he has gained substantial support for MGS and built meaningful relationships with multiple communities and stakeholders. Welcome, Autumn and John. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for the warm introduction. So anyway, we're very pleased to be here today, and uh, we have a number of things that we want to go through, but probably one of the key things is, is that uh, we bring uh, a short history of a reactivated survey. So with that, I'll get started on my first slide that uh, I'm going to go through. And so Michigan Geologic Survey was transferred to Western Michigan University in 2011. And so at that time it was transferred, that was after 30 years of no funding that the survey had. So there was literally no functions going on. Less than 10% of the state have been validated with subsurface geologic data from mapping and publications that actually could be sent it to the public. MGS requested and was asked to present at meetings. And I'm gonna candidly say we didn't turn down anything. So anytime anybody asked to have a presentation, we did it because we had to get the word out because nobody knew what the survey was. We, they were requested, we listened to the requests for geologic data, who, what, and what was needed. And that came from all fashions. And it was a consultants, engineers, state agencies, county, citizens, and anybody that we made presentations to that requested geologic data. And of course, one of the keys is that we need to compile the data into an unbiased geologic data in response to the, the request. But more importantly, it had to be something that people would use. That's because we've been interviewed on local radio, TV, and press over this 10 year period. And it's usually cyclic whenever there's something geologic that occurs, they give us a call. And we know that most, if not all surveys respond in that manner. Some meetings are positive and I'll be candid with you and some are not received positively. It all depends on who's receiving the message and whether or not they believe you. And that's why I'm trying to say is that we present unbiased validated data so that it's so that everybody can make the proper decisions with the right data. Our funding was provided to provide public data at all. And that's what the argument has been for 10 years to try and get that money. Here are some examples of recent meetings of continuous updates. 
I started in this position in October of 2013. So at that time, I started reaching out and I started reaching out to all of the agencies. And at that time, the one agency was called DEQ, but it's now called Eagle, which is Environmental Great Lakes and Energy. And then we had Eagle Empire, which is the PFAS people. And then there was the United Tribes that was out there. This is just a summary of all the people that we talked to, but it's more importantly, it's a talk about where people said that they needed to have mapping. And that was counties where they thought that we did not have, and we do not have enough geologic information to actually understand what the subsurface geology is. And so we have eight counties that we've completed mapping this official geology and that we've published those documents. So as we look and we reach out, we continue to reach out to all these people and that includes the general public as well. Beginning in 2014, starting, and this of course was in October. So I literally had only been on the job a week and a half. And I was asked to speak to what was called then the Michigan Manufacturers Association. At that time, it was an association looking at all the resources of Michigan and what we had and what we didn't know. And so I made my first presentation there in October. And then I had a second meeting with them in January where they wanted to know additional information that we were doing. Then I was invited to speak to the Michigan Tribal Environmental Group, and that was in May of 2014. And that was one of their annual meetings to talk about with all the environmental professionals with the tribes of Michigan. And so that message was also born from the Michigan Bar Association because they wanted to talk to me too about what we were doing. But the primary message was this, we needed to reinvent MGS. And so at that time, Governor Snyder had 10 points in his package that he was talking about. And a lot of it had to do with science, data, and other things. And so that's what we tried to present is to assess the support and logical use of the natural resources because we really didn't have a good understanding of what they were. And so that was to progress the education, not just of us, but also the general public and the state on what our natural resources are because we didn't have a map or any other data that we can use. So going forward then, I would prepare summaries of projects on an annual basis. And this is just an example in 2011 this is the things that we did. In 2016, we received a first tranche of money. At the time, we had no funding that I was getting soft money grants and everything. This is the first money that came from the state, and it was $500,000 for us to start doing things. And then we had a second tranche in 2019 of 500000 That was for PFAS and groundwater monitoring. Well, I would prepare a summary sheet, and at each one of the meetings that I would attend, and I was attending anywhere from 20 to 40 meetings, every year with people and publishing what we were doing. But at the same time, I would bring a poster, a map that actually showed, here's the progress that we're making with that little money that we were getting at the time, because this was spread out, if you will, over two years. And the people that we had to work, I was the only employee, but we were contracting to show the difference, for example, between this is the old geologic map here, and this is the new map that we were developing at the time, so that we have a better understanding of the geology. Those posters were set up in the meetings that we'd have so they go ahead and see exactly what the changes were. And of course, this was limited funds and I would present those updates. Then after for 10 years, we've continued to do that. And so here's one of our groundwater sustainability and this is Michigan chapter of the Soil Water and Conservation Society. And so the meeting presentations were also to Michigan Lakes and Streams Association, looking at things that we're doing. And this is examples of what we've done in 23. And so also the Van Buren Conservation District where they wanted to know what was going on in their particular area. And the last one was Retired Men's Fellowship. And this is just retired scientists that had have a meeting, didn't know anything about it. And they were over on the eastern side of the state and to present what we were doing on the, on the state. And so these were geologists, engineers that worked in consulting that asked to have a presentation. So just looking at what we've done in that period of time, beginning in 2015, there was considerable concern about water, particularly water in Ottawa County. And that's what we had focused on, went up there and met with the county people, but also met with all the well drillers and everything else. And this is an example of a map that we prepared and sitting down with the drillers, but this is a response in five years when we were able to get funding to actually drill monitor wells. I would present to the groundwater board in Ottawa County, and this was to actually present what we were doing. And we had a collaboration and we still have that collaboration from 2015 where they had requests for understanding of the subsurface geology and we put that together. Here's one example of what we had done is that we have all the wells that are in the county and this represents around 23,000 wells that are in the county. And what we've done is said, what is the soils that are near the surface? And this represents the top 15 feet. This is an example of a map that we've done. And so this says, the yellow says that there's sand in the top 15 feet of the soils in this area. And this says that there's clay in the top 15. 
this has relevance for both groundwater recharge as well as groundwater protection and whatever we do. But the other talks about the different types of soils, different type of agriculture and other things that can be done. For example, high sand in soils as we have over here means that you don't have a lot of retention of water in it, which means that if you're gonna grow something, it takes more water. These are all the things that I've learned since I've been here in 10 years, learning more about the agricultural community and what their needs are. But our mapping and our production is to help to do that, to have, have a better understanding of what we're doing. Here's an, just an example of Calhoun County, which is just south of Jackson, that, excuse me, just south of Lansing, straight south of Lansing. But the point is, is that this is what the map looked like in 2014. This is a map from Farron and Bell, 1982. This is the kind of map that everybody used. In our mapping program, and we were mapping quadrangles, and this is the size of a quadrangle here, about 55 square miles. We started mapping the detail of the geologic features, and that's what this represents here. The other thing we started looking at that time were those features that represented sand and gravels near the surface, which meant it was an area for potential recharge, but also an area that we needed to make sure we pointed out to people, don't put an industry there that could contaminate the groundwater because many of these areas were along streams and other things. And as you all know, and is that industries for whatever reason wanna be along a stream or something else. And particularly if they have bad habits or bad control of content or their products or anything else, you can end up contaminating both the surface and the groundwater. So we tried to point these things out in our mapping. So this is the product that we have, and this is the final map product that we have here. A lot of detail, and I know it's small, but this is an example of what we're trying to do to at least get the information off to everybody. The other thing, as I talked about back in 2014, we started meeting with the tribes. I've been meeting with the United Tribes of Michigan for the entire period, except for the two years during COVID. And this is a meeting that we just had in October, where we were asked to come up and talk about what the survey was doing and all the things that we're doing. Part of what we do in those meetings, we put posters up so that we can show some of the results so that we have both the PowerPoint we show, but they also show the maps so they can go around and see how the map products are and we're working. This, by the way, this is the Ottawa County maps that I just showed you, but we're trying to show them what we're trying to do to identify and protect the water resources. In those meetings, I present these posters of production that we've done through the years. And so that helped to gain the proposed the support from United Tribes as we've done it. And so this is just the agenda that we had from the last meeting. But those of you that didn't know is that as far as I know right now, I'm the only state that has a consolidated support from the United Tribes in a state, and in this case, Michigan, for the mapping of our water resources. And of course, mapping of water and aggregates is part of it, but that's this resolution right here. This was signed in 2018 by the tribes. This is what I use all the time when I'm talking to people about, we all need to see this together. We all need to have the mapping and this helped to get the funding that MGS had received in the last year. The other thing that we're doing is that we have these policy groups that are out there. And this one, this is called the Water Use Advisory Council. This is a policy group that started in 2002 in the state. And we make presentations to them sitting on different committees. One of the committees is modeling. The other one is data preservation and data production. And so these are the two that we do serve on. And so I made a presentation to them in December about what we're doing. The other thing I want to emphasize is that we have a number of projects that require student employees. And we've been hiring them now for the last four years. Uh, we've consistently, and I don't know about other surveys, but I have one project that I have over 30 students working for me on the project. And one of the pluses and minuses of COVID was, is that before the COVID, we had to have a computer for them to sit at. Once COVID in, was enacted, we then had to go virtual and that helped us to expand and also get more efficient. We have YouTube videos where we train the people, it's consistent, but we have quality data that we're working on projects and it also allows us to train them in different skills. And some of those skills have to do with data and some of the data has to do with ArcGIS and putting it into geologic maps and helps them to potentially get a job in the future. This is just a summary of what we're doing out there. This is a drilling that we're doing, core drilling. And this is in a place in uh, Ottawa County where we were drilling. And these are two students that are learning to, to log core. They're physically out there logging the core that we're doing. And at the same time, we were installing monitor wells for Ottawa County. This is to look at the groundwater in the area. And this is one of the things that we're doing as a part of the survey right now is to provide the opportunity to put monitor wells in where they want them. And at the same time, this person right here, this is an Otto County representative. This is two students that we're training. And also we have the Department of Natural Resources and other departments come out to see what we're doing as well. 
And so this is a representative of the DNR, Department of Natural Resources, coming out. We invite everybody out to come out when we're doing it. And so that allows everybody to see the kind of things that we are doing. And you can see we have the box core over here and we can show examples of what it is when they show up so that they don't have to be there for the whole project, but we at least have the core out there for the current hole that we're on. So this is to help to inform them about what's going on. We also get faculty members from the local university, Grand Valley State University comes out. We also have uh, people from Michigan State coming out, the geologists when we're working in the area. The other thing that we are doing is that we're training our staff and students. And this is an example of what we've done in the last year is that we want to train them in the kind of equipment that we're using and field equipment. And some of it is just taking, if you will, geophysical readings. And in this case, this is a downhole geophysical survey, downhole logger that we're doing. And this is training some students at Grand Valley. But this right here, this is a previous meeting that we had uh, about eight months ago where we were training people from across the state, both state employees as well as county people just saying this is what it is and show them the gamma logging and the results that you can have. And this is a picture of the recent training that we did with Grand Valley with the students up there. So as we start looking at it, just want to summarize a couple of things of what the real crisis is. If we look at the adjoining state, in this, in this case, look at Illinois. Illinois, this is the mapping that they've done and what they did in priority areas. For the last 25 plus years, there's been money available from the federal government on the USGS federal mapping program. And so Illinois is able to capture about $5 million in that, and it's about $200,000 a year. This is a one-to-one -one cost share, which means that the feds provide a dollar, the state provides a dollar, and so they've been mapping in priority areas. Second one is Indiana that I show. They acquired $4.2 million, and they were priority areas around the greater Indianapolis area, but also in the, this river watershed up here, and this is high agriculture, and wanting to know what the geology is. They had about 4.2, about 178,000. Ohio is a different state that they were mapping in a different format. And I call this their triage mapping, but it generally is a sufficient map. And they've mapped over 80%, but they also benefited from the fact that they were not chasing all federal dollars at the time because they did have funding coming from the resources of gas as well as sand and gravel. They were giving them pennies on whatever they were getting and allowed them to have continuous funding. Whereas none of the other states, including the ones that I have here, had that kind of funding. And Michigan, of course, was way up here at a mere 72,000 a year, that's because we didn't have staff assigned and therefore we didn't have any money that we could show as match. And so that was the reason we had limited dollars. That's now changed with the current funding. So our current mapping program now is looking at asking the questions that I had in that first uh, graph that I showed you before, when we've talked to people from Eagle, as well as MPART, as well as the Agri Association, anybody that wants to know where's the geology tell us, and this is a map showing where the products are that we have right now. And again, less than 10% as any maps that are worth anything. Then we look at where the priorities are that the people had. And then we put a plan together and say, these are the counties that we're going to be mapping. And so this is to try and address the initial questions that we have right now. So is there an unusual character to this? Yes, because this is high population, high density areas. Believe me, we're not omitting the upper peninsula and the northern part of the lower peninsula because they all have priorities. And we're working on those now, now that we have funding. So this is an example of one of the products that we have. And what we try to do is that we have a mapping program that we wanna update any historic maps that are there, that we wanna present a composite of the geologic data for that area. That includes its official geology, that includes water tables, that includes bedrock, thickness of the glacial material and aggregate potential. These are all the things that the citizens and the general public consultants want is that near surface geology. We are not mapping the bedrock. Illinois does map, map bedrock, and that's a different program. And we see that coming on now in the future, now that we have geologists. The Michigan needs sufficient geology in priority areas, and that's what I showed in that first figure. And then mapping the lower peninsula, it's supported funding in the lower peninsula. So the other things that we do produce, this is just an example of what we do produce in this area, is that we have a water table map that we provide, shows what the water table is in the surficial groundwater system. Then we have shade of relief. This is the elevation differences. So you can see what the elevation is. This is actually drift thickness. This is how much sand and gravel that we have. And these right here represent lows in the area. And in some places, people did not know what the difference was. In some places they thought, oh, we only had 150 feet of drift. When in fact, just a mile or two over to another area, we had over 400 feet, almost twice the distance. So our mapping programs helped that. This just shows all of the bedrock topography that we've mapped in the area and shows what the contours are in the bedrock topography. So this is the kind of maps that we're producing. 
So with that, I'm going to transition over to Autumn and I will give her the cursor and she can take over. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, so I joined the survey a little over a year ago, uh, coming from a, a research background, working for a research and development company for about a decade, uh, primarily focused on carbon capture, utilization and storage. Um, and so one of the first things that I you know, strove to understand was what is it we what's the history uh, like John just walked through? Uh, what is it we're trying to do and, and how can we do that and how do we develop a strategy? Uh, to showcase our, our work and get the word out and to engage and educate. Um, so before the before I joined, um, when there wasn't, uh, I think, steady funding, um, McGree, that's the Michigan Geological Repository for Research and Education, um, was kind of this um, um, its own entity where it was living off of, of soft money, um, it, it their their goals was really to to rescue save preserve all the geologic data out there and make it accessible for research and education uh, and so with our funding we were able to come under the umbrella of mgs and get continued support uh for our efforts uh, so the larger mission here for for mgs and for mcgree is to uh, facilitate that basic and applied geologic research we want to train students and, and help develop the uh, future geoscientists for different types of careers, uh, promote our educational outreach, uh, preserve our geologic data and information, and as John mentioned, that provide that validated data, that unbiased, trustworthy data and information. Uh, to do this, we have established and maintained, uh, I think, really impactful relationships as with academia, industry, uh, government, and other types of entities. Uh, we conduct research um, in all different areas. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm largely in CCUS, but there are other types of areas that we support as well. Um, we conduct research to understand the, the geology of Michigan. Uh, we collaborate with on all levels, so local national and even international projects. Uh, we develop programs, educational programs, and uh, we implement professional public outreach, and we integrate all this together, whether it's the geotechnical findings and data and societal uh, considerations. All right. <laughs> uh, so building off of uh, the extensive work that John has done to to build up the, um, the the geological survey and looking forward to how how do we learn from this and and apply what's been done and grow it to um, to CCUS, uh, particularly with outreach and community benefits and these what are called these community benefits plans. Um, these are now these kind of required documents for federal funding, and there's a lot of components to them. So there's a few, I think, terms I'd like to to define here as I'll throw them out throughout the last few slides. Uh, is that CCUS, that's carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Uh, when we talk about things like ethics and geosciences, uh, my favorite quote here or, or definition here comes from the UK Geological Society. Uh, where it values which underpin appropriate behaviors and practices wherever human activities interact with the Earth system. And I think this is really important when it comes to some of these other terminologies. So environmental justice is an important thing to understand uh, and understand how uh, it interacts with your research and with projects. And this is a social move it, movement to address environmental injustice. Uh, this is typically with poor or disadvantaged communities, and they're harmed by human activities. And this could be things like hazardous waste, uh, pollution, land use, uh, and so on. Now, disadvantaged communities then are, it's a community that reaches a defined threshold. And those thresholds um, are defined by different types of factors like environmental or climate indicators, um, uh, poverty uh, is another one, and these thresholds are, are and some other social economic type of indicators. And this is a federal definition that I'm showing because uh, there are some other uh, definitions out there too. Uh, and then Justice 40. So this is a, an initiative with our current administration where we want to deliver at least 40% of our benefits from federal investments to advance disadvantaged communities. So what we want to show is that the work that we're doing, the research and these projects are going to directly benefit um, our communities and our society in some way. So another thing to be aware of is the, the impact of opinions and beliefs, uh, misconceptions 
that can have on our fields of, of research. Uh, here's a couple of headlines that I, I just snagged from, from Google. I put in, you know, CCUS and see what kind of headlines pop up. Uh, these were the most, some of the more colorful ones, if you will, that came up like carbon capture, billions of federal dollars poured into failure, or a study shows carbon sequestration can cause quakes. Um, top five reasons CCUS is bogus. Um, what the fossil fuel industry hopes you won't find out is that carbon capture is already a failure of experiment funded with taxpayer money. Um, so there's a, and a lot of folks, you know, get their information, of course, from, from Googling things, from, from the news. So understanding what is being said and how it's being said is really important. And not just, not just at that scale. Uh, here's a handful of examples from folks within my CCUS circle, people that I've interacted with at, at um, conferences. So we have similar, I would say similar backgrounds, um, similar areas of interest, and that we get pretty broad uh, opinions even in that type of circle. Things like it's a false narrative of jobs and economics when people aren't believing that, that CCUS could have uh, a growth of jobs or be economic. Um, on the opposite of that is that I hear people talk about positives and that this could create opportunities for jobs and, and be a wonderful transition from oil and gas, or that CCUS is just an excuse to prolong oil and gas, or that it's absolutely necessary to help us meet our climate goals and our energy goals, um, and that it won't work or it will work. Uh, so understanding what the, the narrative is, uh, what the opinions are, where it's coming from, uh, is really important to help you develop your strategies moving forward. So the strategy, biggest strategy I want to start with is is having a learner mindset. Uh, so coming in with a, an open mind, ready to hear and to learn, and not just to 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 teach, not to push your own agenda and your own opinions, but to understand where people are coming from, why they think and feel the the way they do. So to start with this is that all concerns are valid and understand that most of these concerns are coming from a place of ignorance or a want or need to either protect themselves, protect their families, their community, their land, their property. Um, so it's it's coming from that angle that's important. And then to ask questions. Why, why do they have these concerns? Understand what the priorities are. Understand what's important to them and to their community. Um, and then that can be a great foundation to building a relationship, building trust, and start learning how, okay, so how do I educate them on and help to ease some of their concerns? Uh, another great strategy I want to bring up is the HEMAS principles. This was developed in 1996. Uh, there is a group of 40 people um, of color, of different backgrounds, uh, different countries. They met in HEMAS, New Mexico. Uh, and for a working group on globalization and trade. And because of this diversity of people and backgrounds, uh, they needed to develop some common understandings so that they could have a productive um, and um, non-disruptive uh, workshop so that they can say what they need to say and come to agreement and meet their goals. Uh, so they came up with these set of principles. Um, to start with, they, they aim to be inclusive, um, emphasize bottom-up organization, to let people speak for themselves, uh, to work together in solidarity and mutuality, build just relationships amongst, our, amongst themselves or ourselves, and commitment to self-transformation. So again, kind of coming back to that learner mindset, being ready to learn and being ready to, to be adaptive um, and um, build a relationship. So this continues to build is, uh, then how are we going to take these types of principles and work them into our own strategies for stakeholder and community engage engagement. So we started to emphasize, here's what we wanted um, to pull out. Uh, so we wanted to have participation. We wanted people to get involved and be interested, be curious. Uh, we wanted to provide consultation. Um, like John had mentioned, going through all these different groups, saying yes to all these presentations. Uh, so it can really start uh, educating people, but also hearing what is important to them building collaboration so that it's not just us, you know, uh, working on a project or just us saying things, but it's a potential to work together, um, sharing all of our information and our data, 
um, that leads to empowerment. So people feel empowered to make their decisions um, when they have that data information available. Uh, encouraging two-way communication. So again, we're not the only ones talking um, and encouraging other folks to participate and uh, be a part of that communication and establishing processes uh, to help make these um, collaborations and engagement um, efficient. And this can happen at multiple scales. So we took these strategies. This is an example of a, of a recent project that we kicked off. Uh, we started this project off with um, a collaboration from um, multiple entities, and we wanted to set some goals right at the beginning. So understanding um, what our project is, what we're trying to do with our project, but then how are we going to communicate? Uh, let's let's make sure everyone feels comfortable and safe. So we started off with just the first couple of these is that every team member has the right to be heard uninterrupted and the responsibility to contribute and use a respectful tone and language. And from there, we open it up to say, what else should we add in here? What other goals should we set as a team? And this built into being present, being an active listener, um, that, that all ideas are encouraged. Let's have fun and collaborate, but also let's stick to our goals and timelines and deliverables and budgets because all of that's important. And to do that, we need to communicate regularly, voice our concerns and our needs. Uh, we need to be flexible. And then back to this learner mindset or educational mindset of being curious and asking questions and being open to learn. And I think that was a really great uh, uh, exercise for this project and it really set the, the tone for how this project will move forward. So the next thing I mentioned is this community benefits plans or these or community impact plan, plan sorry, or um, societal considerations. They've had a few different names. This is, is an evolving um, requirement on federal projects. Um, but across these different plans, um, there's a lot of things that um, we're being asked to, to consider and include. Uh, so diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility is big. Uh, and so what, how can you incorporate those um, practices and develop strategies so that it's part of um, your entire project? Uh, and then how are we meeting a Justice 40 initiative? What are the benefits that are com coming out of here? Um, being aware, are there any potential negative impacts and how do we mitigate those impacts? Um, being truthful and uh, transparent about um, both the good and the bad. Um, can this lead to quality jobs? Uh, how can we develop our engagement with communities and stakeholders? Uh, and understanding that all of this will evolve over time. And so our strategy is to think of this as um, an integrated process so that um, not every single one of these aren't going to be in a bubble, but they're all going to come together to make a successful project. So back to some of our, our missions with this, with our outreach and our, our goals is to make outreach reach all audiences. Uh, so we have a lot of different avenues for, for outreach, and we design them to target different audiences and different communities. For example, we have workshops, uh, and these can be tar targeted towards industry, research, and ag uh, academia, and even regulatory. Um, we have a core kids program. This is a K through 12 outreach and education program. We, we reach up to 15,000 students uh, a year and thousands of general public with this. That's including their like their parents, uh, family members, it could be um, a, a public um, table at an event. So it could be um, a, a broad variety of folks from public, uh, from the public. And then we host tours and give presentations. So uh, we have had uh, regulators, policymakers, legislators, um, all so sorts of folks come uh, to us so that we can show them um, our rocks, <laughs> show them our warehouse, show them our research, have even some hands-on um, uh, experiments so that they can really gauge some of these concepts uh, that we're trying to educate. And we host a lot of students and professors from various universities even. Uh, so I have a variety of, of some of our favorite photos from the past year or so. Um, we had a representative come in um, to learn about our research and we had set up this little experiment where you pump air into different cores, uh, samples of rock to see, learn about their properties. Um, and this is a favorite for, for kids through adults. And so we always try to set this one up. 
Uh, this is our industry event that we have every year where we've had over 100 folks come and we give a variety of presentations uh, on um, our not just our research, but their research too. So again, this kind of two-way communication, so we're learning from each other. Um, we had a, there's our student, one of our students giving a poster. Uh, we have uh, international collaboration. This is a colleague from Australia where we're trying to understand um, some of the complexities in our rocks and we're seeing some similar trends um, in, Austra in Australia that we see in Michigan. So understanding what does that mean and maybe we can figure out what that means together. Um, this is uh, Dr. Peter Voice. He, is, he goes out with a lot of uh, teachers for some different uh, workshops to train the teachers. So there's teaching them about some of the rocks and some of the fossils that can be found in Michigan. Um, and then some of our some of the kids that come in for a visit as well. So overall, our goal here is to, to establish ourselves as trustworthy and unbiased source for data and information. And we do that through this variety of outreach. Uh, so another way we uh, approach that we're taking is making sure um, that there's multiple ways for folks to engage with us and stay updated. And with that, we had to embrace the, the social media world, um, which is uh, maybe not the easiest for, for some of us here to do, uh, but we established a newsletter. So this reaches, our mailing list probably has about, you know, 500 or so folks on it. Uh, and I'm from all different types of um, industries. Uh, and um, so it, it summarizes our work for the quarter. And then we have built our social media platforms. We have Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn. And then we have a really great YouTube channel now. So another way that we can showcase our work and to educate. So we have a whole series of different uh, types of videos from, from geotourism to um, influential women in geosciences from Michigan uh, to Michigan geology to some different fundamentals and some training uh, videos as well. Uh, and this is a continuing to to grow our, our YouTube channel as well. Uh, so we got quite a few folks coming in, watching our videos and sharing our videos. Uh, it's a great way uh, to share and, and to learn. Uh, so with that, we can open it up for questions. Great, thank you, so, thank you both so much. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you can drop any questions in the chat. And I actually have one um, to start us off. It sounds like you have a lot of long-term relationships that you've built and sustained throughout um, your time at the Michigan Geological Survey. I'm wondering um, what are some important things for sustaining relationships, especially when you have challenges like uncertain funding or world events like the COVID pandemic? Well, putting it bluntly is that uh... The COVID probably helped us to expand because before they had to be one-on-one -on -one and, and now virtual has really helped us to meet more people because then we don't have the travel issue because uh, Michigan's not a small state when people want to talk to you, for example, in the northern part of the lower peninsula. But the whole point is, is that try to keep those things open, but I also try to attend association meetings. We have we have regional and national association, American Waterworks Association. We have American Association of Counties. And all of those have meetings. And so they tend to extend an invitation. And if the invitation is extended, then we go and we try and present where we're at because it allows us to talk. So bottom line is, is that those happened at the start, going out and talking to everybody. They continued because they continued to invite us to come. And then the last thing was with COVID it allows us to go virtual because then we can be more responsive to things such as this, where we're here, we have a lot of things going on here, but we're able to support you in the things you want. And I think that other surveys are seeing the same thing, that they have the ability to be more effective in communicating with more people. I, I hope I answered the question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question here, do you have any advice for organizations or individuals who are sort of just getting started in community engagement? How might you identify partners, um identify funding any other advice there i'll comment and then i'll let autumn do it <laughs> my mine has been through asking questions and so i think i pointed that out at the start is that i wanted to always find out what were the concerns that the citizens had the people at the meeting a lot of them were officials and some of them were citizens at the meeting 
try and identify, and then to see how we could effectively match those needs with what we were doing to try and answer the questions. And so that's what I believe helped us to get the funding is that ask the questions what, what their concerns are. And again, ours is unva unbiased, validated data that we're providing. So always talking about the science of geology. And then the other component that I want to also say is emphasizing that we want to try and educate our new geoscientists. And so we always want to have students and other things working with us on it because we know that the, the group that we're talking to, many times there are kids that are there and everything else at these meetings that are at different types of meetings. And it's a good way of exchanging information so that we can do it. So that's what I found. Yeah, you know, I'll just I'll just say that, you know, I'm a geologist. I um, was trained in geology, I'm not trained in, um, in outreach and engagement and social sciences at all. Um, so it's been a real learning curve. So uh, approaching this again from that learner mindset uh, and start doing some homework, start reading up what are folks doing, what are the different strategies that they're taking um, and connecting with people. Uh, a big uh, help for me was connecting with um, some mentors that had a lot more experience in this uh, a few years ago so that I could start learning from them. I'm just asking, hey, can I can I support? Can I be a part of this? I, I want to learn and and having some reliable folks that you can uh, send some questions to uh, when things come up. Uh, so that's been the most impactful for me on getting going with the, the outreach and, get, and engagement. Okay, great. And we have another question. Um, during these outreach events, do you have specific demonstrations or hands-on activities that um, might be put somewhere or posted by MGS so that the educational demonstrations might be replicated or shared by others? I'll go first on this. I showed you the signs that I put up, particularly for the tribal nations. That's what I was doing at any meetings that I attended, showing some of the old data and the new data, and that allowed questions to be answered. And so that was my physical way. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So we have uh, quite a few different things that that we like to set out for demonstrations. That a couple of those photos I showed earlier with the with the core pumps on there. That's our our most popular. These couple of photos here, um, and we've uh, had several folks reach out to us to make some, and we have we've and I think the past year we've made a, a few sets of those. Uh, we created a, a YouTube video to accompany those to talk about um, the some of the properties that we're tr hopefully trying to teach people about with this. And then we have a um, outreach coordinator who is also a teacher and she creates um, um, uh, lesson plans to accompany, accom accompany these type of um, experiments, but also to go with all of our YouTube videos too. Uh, so then folks can come up and, and say, how can we use these videos for, for our, our classrooms? Um, and we're, this is something we're continuing to develop, uh, you know, as when we come up with new displays or new videos, um, that's one thing that we always look to, um, to create, to go with it is some, some sort of um, material so that folks can use this uh, down the road. The other thing that we do do is that we have students working for us here as well, and particularly when we attend these meetings, we have different types of rock samples of the different types of rock that are here in Michigan, whether it's a Petoskey stone or some other uh, rock that's here, we try and put samples in plastic bags to offer them to people either as donations or gifts that they can pick up. So it at least generates interest in what the rocks look like that they can't see here in Michigan because we have a significant part of the state that you can't see the rocks. And so we do have examples here. So that's what we try and do is at least offer some samples of what it looks like. Um, and then one last thing to add to that too is that for, um... Uh, recent proposals, we're trying to incorporate this as a big part of it so that we have the funding to develop more outreach materials um, specifically to target the communities where that project will be most active. Um, so that, you know, it's it's resources are always a, a big part of how much you can do uh, and how much you can, you know, create with it. So um, that's part of our strategy too, is work this into our funding wherever possible. The other thing that... Uh the survey and myself have been actively involved in the National Academy of Sciences, as well as the G American Geosciences Institute, AGI. Both of us are looking at the future of geoscientists, but we're also looking at the, the future of climate change and other things. Those of you that didn't know, AGI does on an annual basis, 
offer these little training manuals and uh, bags of information. And the one now is on climate that you can get. Uh, if you have a geologic survey, you can get 50 free of those. And otherwise, you, you can pay for them. But they make a good, if you will, current period of information that you can hand out and have at the tabletop when you're at little meetings or something like that, AGI. Great, thank you so much. Another question is how might you convince a reluctant collaborator to buy into your project or mission? Uh, they either, I'm gonna put it bluntly, <laughs> they either buy it or they don't. And so uh, just try and present it as unbiased information. And I, I'm not trying to say which side of the fence we're on or anything. It's just that we're providing the information so that people can make the decision. Uh, I've been in too many meetings where somebody has said, well, this is wrong. And I say, I beg to differ with you, but this is actually factual data and you can use it or not use it, but uh, that's what it is. And some of it, my perspective is, is that it's people that really don't understand what factual data is. And so they're going to argue that. So present the data. You're not going to walk away with hundred percent. As I said, in my presentation, not all the meetings have people that go away positively. And that's just one of the cases that it is. And so as long as you're consistent and you're not being contradictory or different in what you present, it's valid data. I think that you have every chance of at least winning the greater proportion of the population. Some people you're not going to convince. Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree with John that you can't win them all. Um, certainly there, there's going to be folks who are, are very much set in, in their beliefs, whether um, it, it follows the facts or not. Um, but again, just kind of approaching that from your, from our standpoint is that we want to learn from you. We want to understand why, you know, you, you think this and, and then open up that conversation. So encouraging, hopefully encouraging them to be more curious and start having the conversation, uh, will lead us to them being open to learning. Um, but if folks aren't open to learning, then that becomes a, a really big challenge. And, I, and that Autumn just brought something up is that. We really want to find out what is driving their concern and what the issue is, because maybe I didn't say it right. Maybe we didn't say it correctly. And so potentially at that same exchange that you can re-characterize what you said on this so that it comes from their perspective to answer their question. Because sometimes people have the question from their perspective, what we presented was not to answer their question because we didn't know what their question was until we started having an interaction. Great. And another question is, I know you mentioned um, sort of the different contexts of different states, and I'm wondering on projects that you may have multi-state collaborations or sort of outside of Michigan, how do you approach kind of these projects with community engagement? Uh, in a general sense, from the geologic survey perspective, uh, we have an organization called the Great Lakes coalition. It's a, all the Great Lakes states, eight Great Lakes states. And we meet once a year to talk about common geologic issues. And that is Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York. So it's all the states that abut the Great Lakes. We have common geology and common issues on a lot of things, and some of them are unique. And so all that we've tried to do is if something comes up, we bring it up. We just had our meeting, for example, here in Kalamazoo this year. Uh, in January, and we were talking about common issues, and one of them is not just unique to Michigan, but it's what's our groundwater, what, what's happening with our groundwater, because every single part of the Great Lakes, as well as the U.S., is growing. They have communities growing, and a good proportion of their drinking water supplies come from groundwater. So that's one of the things that we talk about in mapping. So that's that's how we try and collaborate and then say, just as you asked. How do we communicate? And, and part of it is just what we're talking about now, showing them the data, showing what we have, or showing them what we don't have and what we need to get, because that, in some cases, is the case. Yeah, and, and making sure that it's a, a, a true coalition or collaboration. Uh, you know, I'm not going to come and to Illinois and, and pretend that I know the, the communities and the people better than the folks that are working in Illinois. You know, my, my um, expertise would be in Michigan. I've been uh, involved with a couple of large multi-state uh, collaborations. A couple, one current one is about 20 states um, broad, so it covers a lot of areas. So we have um, leads essentially in each state 
that then um, is responsible for that community and outreach in their region. Uh, but we develop a, like a working group, if you will, of, of coming together and say, what kind of materials that can we create that are um, shareable across state boundaries that are they, and then that's going to come more down to the the factual type of information. Um, what can we, what kind of displays can we come up, a, up with? Are there educational materials that we can share? Are there fact sheets and flyers and um, YouTube videos or, or things like that? And then we also have um, regular meetings with uh, folks that are conducting the outreach. And then we have an annual in-person meeting so that we can all come together and and stay updated. Um, you know, virtual is is so wonderful, but it's also great to to touch base in person and have those uh, um, one on one conversations. The other thing that I uh, just wanted to bring up, too, is that you talked about adjoining states is that uh, the geologic surveys belong to an association called the Association of American State Geologists, AASG. And that's an organization that's been around for about 94 years. It represents all the geologic surveys across the state. We have semi-annual and annual meetings to talk about common issues uh, in the states. And that's how we bring them up. And it has evolved. I've been involved in it just the 10 years that I've been here, but it's evolved to where we have just single things, but where we have more outreach going on at those meetings. And what Autumn brought up is exactly right is that you bring up topics and everybody wants to find out, well, how can we try and answer it? And so then we end up having video calls afterwards to talk about it, to, to focus on it. But we all understand that there are some issues that you don't have all the answers, but how can we communicate that to the public? Because each group of public people have a different perspective. And so that's what we're all trying to do. And so that's the Association of American State Geologists. And I was president three years of that organization. And I just encourage anybody, anybody that's involved with any survey or any activity to get involved with national associations so that you can start hearing the words of not just what's happening locally, but what's happening nationally. And that just means that you have to be involved and you have to volunteer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then that builds up your your network and yeah. who to contact, because that's right. not always easy is to say, right. you know, I haven't worked in, uh, you know, Arkansas or something. Who do I contact in Arkansas, right. but if you're on these type of um, organizations, then um, you have those type of contacts uh, readily available to you. Great. Um, next question. I know you kind of touched on this a little bit, but how have you in uh, your personal work gone about sort of balancing research with the community engagement, especially when there's uncertain funding? I. I'll answer it bluntly, do what you can with what you've got. <laughs> I, because I had no nickels essentially for the first two years, but I was able to get my gas paid for it to go. And I went to meetings and did presentations. And so you do what you have to do to make it happen. But if you have to produce something, then it requires money and other things. And particularly if you have to do, produce something that you don't have the capability of doing. So I'm just saying, start small, uh, do what you can, uh, and then, see how you can do outreach to try and get additional money. I will comment on our core kids program. It started probably 14 years ago before the survey was transferred here. And it was seen as a real benefit to the educational high school teachers and grade school teachers in the state of Michigan. Money was provided by one of the large electric utility companies here to, to provide seed money for that to get started. And that's how the whole core kids program started. But it actually, allowed us to go ahead and develop a template for what we're doing. You never know when somebody's gonna go ahead and offer something that's needed. That's why you need to attend as many meetings as possible and, and never stop saying your hand is out for, for help for certain things if you know that you have a reason to show it. And you know, there's a lot of low cost things that you can, can do for outreach and education. Um, especially with the virtual world and social media. Uh, so those don't, you know, cost anything more than than your time that you put into it. Um, and so those are a really great, uh, I think, outlet to showcase what you're doing, uh, what you're working on, why it's important, uh, and to connect with others. So if you can't go to a conference or you can't travel uh, because your funds are limited, uh, there's there's so many uh, great networks that are, that are uh, online uh, that you can connect with. Um, one example is our, you know, our YouTube videos is our high profile. Um, they surprisingly aren't a, a high cost item for us to produce. So we actually do that all ourselves. Uh, we have a, a, a group of uh, young professionals who are just really tech savvy. 
Uh, and I would, we were trying to do some estimates the other day and it's somewhere around like two to three hours, I think was the the average for, to produce one of our videos. Um, so when you think, you know, a couple of hours of, of uh, you know, young professionals time, um, you can get a whole lot of exposure and outreach education engagement for low cost. Great, and then a last question, unless we have any others that come through the chat, and it actually builds off really well um, what you were just mentioning, but I was just wondering um, with both of your backgrounds, do you have any advice to young professionals or young research who, researchers who are just kind of getting started? Yeah, I do. I, I said it before, volunteer. <laughs> uh, just be active. If you find out there's a meeting or something else, professional meeting, go to it, help. Sit at the table and listen to the professional talk because sometimes they just need somebody to kind of handle what's going on at a particular meeting. And, and I know that I've been very pleased to have as many as I've had join us here at Michigan Geologic Survey when we do these meetings. But I also know I did that before I was here is that you have to volunteer. And if you're not volunteering, that means you're not giving back. That's just my comment. I, yeah, I absolutely 100% agree is that getting involved in an organization um, not, is not just, uh, you know, exposure for yourself, but it's the networking, it's it's connecting with, um, you know, peers, colleagues, and, and mentors. I can't emphasize having a mentor or mentors that you can rely on that doesn't have to be within your organization, um, but outside your organization. And those you, you will find through those, those uh, from volunteering. Um, I've had a few different mentors now, and um, I, I can probably easily say uh, um, they have played a significant role in my career development. And by the way, when you volunteer, sometimes your registration is paid. So you just need yeah. to get there. Well, thank you both so much. I wanted to ask if you have any final thoughts that you want to leave us with before we uh, wrap up here at around 1 p.m. Well, personally, I hope that we've contributed to providing some information and guidance to you. What we've done, it was kind of a very quick, I call it the fire hose uh, presentation of everything we did, but it's over time. Nothing happens right away. It's just, I say, take small bites. It's like, how do you eat an elephant? Small bites? Well, you just take small bites at it and just try and address it. And from my perspective and the Michigan Geologic Survey perspective, we were successful in doing it so that we actually were able to provide that kind of information to people and it. We were succeeded in getting annual funding. And I'll just say, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, you know, our contact information is here on this slide. Um, always happy to, to chat, um, go through ideas, brainstorm, answer questions, uh, collaborate. Always especially happy to, to collaborate on, on current and future projects. Great, thank you both so much. And thank you for all of our attendees um, who came online today. We also have a couple of thank yous in the chat. So I just wanted to pass that along to John and Autumn. Um, and we do have one last seminar um, next uh, week, our last one of the semester. And it also has a community engagement theme, but it's more centered on green chemistry. So we hope to see you all there um, and thank you again. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, everybody.